Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this really important debate here. I want to start off by um, thanking the candidates on stage um, for um, taking the time to run for public office and to run for school committee. It's a, a really big sacrifice and a really important, obviously, getting involved in uh, the public education in Somerville is something we all care deeply about in this room. So thank you for that. Um, up here, I'm going to reintroduce the candidates again so everyone has a sense of who's up in front of us. Um, so we have two candidates running for Ward 7 um, School Committee. Carrie Norman is running the first year. And Tara Tanike, also Ward 7. And then we have two candidates running from Ward 3, uh, Sarah Phillips. And Michelle Lippitz. Um, so quickly about the format of how this is going to run. So this is a little different than the previous uh, candidate statements that we took. Um, so we will start off with uh, opening statements, in which case you have prepared statements. You'll have two minutes and 30 seconds for those. Nate will give you a cue when you have 30 seconds left with a yellow and then a red when you're out of time, in which I might interrupt <laughs> and thank you. All right. Um, after that, we are going to have some questions um, that were both either submitted by community groups or prepared by our Revolution Somerville. Um, you're going to have one minute to respond to those questions, and Nate will cue you with 15 seconds when you get the yellow card and then red again when you're out of time. Um, yeah, so it's a bit of a speed round because right. we got a lot of candidates tonight. Um, and uh, just for the crowd out there, I know that um, a lot of people in this room are passionate about education. You might notice that at your table in the middle are index cards. So um, we are hoping to at least reserve time for one, maybe two questions from the audience. So if you have a question you'd like to see um, asked of uh, the people running for school committee, if you could write that down on the index card. And then uh, Sergeet, who's in the back of the room waving there, she'll collect them and bring them up to me so that I can include them in this debate. So um, with that, we will get started. So I'd like to start off with opening statements. Uh, as we go through the questions, I'm going to rotate who starts answering the questions. I'll let you know who that is every time. But um, for now, we'll start with Carrie. You're quite, you can start. OK. Um, hi, I'm Carrie Norman, and I'm really happy to be here tonight. Uh, as you can, I'm two weeks out of surgery, and uh, you guys have been great about accommodating my scooter. It's going to be a little while before I'm on the doors. So this is an important opportunity for me to be able to get to talk to a lot of people. Uh, I'm a proud parent of the 2019 Somerville High School graduate and a rising sophomore. For 13 years, I've been active in the Somerville Public Schools as a weekly reading tutor, a school council chair, and for the past six years as Ward 7 School Committee representative. Uh, my network is both broad and deep across Ward 7 and the district, making me an effective representative. On my first, one of my first votes on school committee was making educating and caring for the whole child the district's number one goal, instead of setting goals around the MCAS scores, as was previously done. As a result of this vote, I've been able to champion innovation and equity across the district. To name just a few of the projects, creating a pre-K classroom at the West Somerville Neighborhood School with after school, we later were able to add a, a, after school for the pre-K, Launching an early education initiative that goes far beyond schools, starting at birth and includes area child care providers. Being a state leader in developing assessments as an alternative to MCAS. Redesigning the education plans for the next wave full circle therapeutic schools in Somerville High School. Expanding out of school programming with a focus on middle grades and historically underserved students. Forming the Somerville's Children's Cabinet, which is a collaboration between the district and the city to provide wraparound services uh, to students and families, because we know when our students and families have health needs, housing needs, transportation needs, they're not ready to learn. So uh, that is something I've been actually one of the founding members of that. Increasing student mental health supports available at the schools so that kids in crisis don't have to be on waiting lists and pioneering multiple pathways to graduation, and so much more. Currently, the school committee is developing an equity policy and has mapped out a three-pronged initiative to catalyze change throughout our community. We will focus on more equitable budgeting, a comprehensive study of student enrollments across the district, and developing a workforce that more closely reflects our student body. I am running for my fourth term because I have a demonstrated record of advocating for progressive 
policies that benefit the students of Ward 7 and across the district. And for me, progressive education means educating all 5,000 of our students well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now, Tara Tonight, also Ward 7. That's okay, you got it. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Tara Tonight. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Uh, I believe it's time, a little closer. All right. I believe it's time for a change. Uh, the Somerville School Committee needs a fresh perspective. I'm a mother, a stakeholder in our community, and a progressive educator. My husband and I have lived in Somerville for 14 years, and we have two sons. They're 11 and 7. They attend the East Somerville Community School. I have worked as an educator for over 10 years, teaching mathematics, first at Prospect Hill Academy Charter School at the upper school campus in Cambridge, and later at Charlestown High School, where I still teach today. I have a lot of experience working with low-income children of color, and I believe to my core that every child, regardless of race, ethnicity, or income, deserves and should receive a high-quality education that prepares them for the future, no matter what that looks like. Like many of our neighbors, my husband and I chose to live in Somerville because it is the most dynamic, most diverse, and most awesome place to live. We believe Somerville Public Schools has a lot to offer our children. Yet, our district faces a lot of distinct challenges because our population has a lot of different needs. The school committee has worked on essential services like expanded pre-K access, um, but I know there's still more work to be done um, to ensure that students are prepared to tackle the future challenges in our world. Representing values of community voice, accountability, and innovation, I aim to ensure, one, that all students have resources, high expectations, and support to thrive <clears throat> today and in the future. This includes access to student services, enrichment programming, and innovative, innovative teaching methods and curriculum design. Two, that we support district staff. They feel valued and supported. Our district is stronger when we attract, retain, and develop exceptional teachers and staff, especially those who reflect our student population. And three, that all community members are engaged and empowered to lift their voices to the school committee and district leadership. Diversity, equity, inclusion, and progress will be the center of every decision I make as a school committee representative. The future is now for Somerville Public Schools. The status quo will no longer suffice as our children deserve more and we are missing opportunities that we cannot afford to miss if we are going to be truly progressive. As a school committee rep, I will partner with all stakeholders to ensure our children's education is forward thinking and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to Ward 3, Sarah Phillips. My name is Sarah Phillips, and I'm seeking your endorsement for School Committee Ward 3. Four things motivated me to get into the race this year. First, I'm a parent. I have a daughter in second grade at the Argenziano and a son who will be in our public schools soon. I want the best for my kids and for all our kids. Second, I'm an activist. Since moving to Somerville 10 years ago, I helped stop a charter school. I helped get preschool classrooms in several of our elementary schools. I sat on the city's child and youth study team. I currently sit on the Argenziano School Improvement Council. And most recently, I led a campaign to get the state to reopen my son's daycare when they tried to shut it down. Third, while getting a PhD in social policy, I was fortunate to receive a fellowship from Harvard to work in state government at the Executive Office of Education. There, I was shocked to learn that no one on the Secretary's policy team believed teachers needed unions. When I was a teacher, I had 37 kids in my seventh grade classroom. I know that school administrators often make decisions that are in the best interest of the system, not our kids, and I want policymakers who understand that teachers unions are part of the solution, not the problem. <laughs> Lastly, I'm motivated to run for school committee because this is the work that I do professionally. Like most of our current school committee members, I have direct classroom experience. I taught English as a second language in the Oakland, California public schools and went on to teach reading in Juvenile Hall. I decided to leave the classroom because I knew that even if I was the best teacher in the world, the system was still gonna fail my kids, and I wanted to change the system. 
I became a social worker and spent the next chunk of my career building bridges between schools and their communities and working to integrate services. Since getting my PhD, I've worked with districts like the Pittsburgh Public Schools and the Washington DC Public Schools on many of the issues that we're grappling with here. My own research shows that when kids think their schools are racist, sexist, classist, and homophobic, their sense of belonging suffers, and so does their attendance and their behavior. I am proud to have received the endorsement of the National Association of Social Workers, Massachusetts PACE. If elected, I would be the only social worker on the school committee. I have also been endorsed by the Massachusetts Women's Political Caucus. If elected, I would focus on four broad priorities. Getting more push-in teachers in our elementary schools to help us meet the academic needs of all our kids. Wrapping social services around every family that needs them. Establishing high quality, accessible, affordable, out of school time programming and improving the climate of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our schools. At the same time, I would draw on my community organizing skills to foster authentic collaboration between the school committee, the school department, and all sectors of a diverse community. Thank you. And we'll now hear from Michelle Evans, also Ward 3. Yes, thank you. Um, my printer's broken, so I apologize. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Michelle Lippins, and I'm currently a public school teacher and a parent running for Ward 3 School Committee. I know the school system from both sides, and I want to bring that insight to the school committee. We need a teacher's voice now and always. This perspective is essential for us to address the educational disparities that are taking place within our school district. There is no one path for solving this problem of inequity in our schools. I do know that the solution exists in the collaboration of multiple perspectives coming together to bring about change. I've been a public school teacher for over a decade, specializing in educating students with special needs. I tell my students that smart is not something you are, it is something you become. So here I am, I'm stepping up because I want to help all our kids become active, lifelong learners and engaged citizens of this community. Somerville Public Schools is working hard to address the gaps in academic achievement. Our MCAS scores show that we are failing our special education population and our English language learners. In order to do better, we need to have an open conversation about what is happening inside our classrooms. I know firsthand how policy and curriculum directly impact our students, teachers, and support professionals in our schools. I know the potential drawbacks as well as the potential benefits of these policies in action. Somerville is going through some significant growth and changes right now, and I know that a teacher voice will be instrumental in promoting a positive school climate that is inclusive, safe, welcoming to everyone, no matter where they come from or how long they've lived in our community. Students are more than just data points. I know the importance of considering the whole child. My grassroots activism happens every day, teaching students a new way to tackle a complex math problem, incorporating underrepresented voices through literacy, practicing mindfulness, which I need to do right now, to reduce anxiety <laughs> and stress, directly advocating for services to meet the needs of our students and so much more. For those educators in the room, you know what I mean. Uh, more importantly, I know how to listen in order to make sure every voice is heard, whether it be parents, teachers, support profession professionals, administrators, and our kids. I see the benefits of schools, families, and the community coming together for a shared goal of helping every student live up to their full potential. Thank you so much. Thank you for those statements. So we'll now jump into the questions. Um, so again, candidates, you'll have one minute to respond. I know we could talk about these issues for way more than one yeah. minute, and that's uh, quite a constraint to put on you, but um, given the time factors and the rest of the programming, that's what we have. Nate will give you a 15 second yellow card so you know uh, when you gotta start wrapping things up. Um, I'm glad you guys, uh, I heard from all candidates, brought up the issue of equity because we were definitely gonna lean into that a little bit tonight. So um, Carrie, you're gonna start this first question and then we'll go straight down the line and then we'll alternate for the next question. So with a school district that's over 60% students of color, do you believe that there needs to be more representation of people of color within the schools? 
And if so, what are some specific ways you would push for more diversity in our schools? Uh, that's a great question. So um, I just got really flustered. I'm only two weeks out from surgery, so I'm a little not on the top of my game. Uh, in terms of hiring, so in, in diversifi diversifying our staff, there we go. Um, I need mindfulness too. Uh, there's a number of concrete steps, right? It's easy to say things in, in big, broad equity languages. Co our, our last two para contracts, we added para, uh, which is more minority student uh, staff, uh, pathways for professional development, more levels of salary, how do you develop careers at that within the system, both from to diversify our staff from hiring in, but also developing our local talent. How do we make these jobs that people in our, our community can continue to grow? Um, we have, there's very intentional hiring in the upper levels of administration uh, to diversify, to have our, our administrators, our leaders look more like our students and to include um, it is, a minute is really <laughs> short. I can't wait till I'm the last one to answer. Great, right. uh, yeah, don't worry, you're the first that time, but <laughs> you'll get to, you'll get to have was... lots of time to think next one. Um, right. Tara, your turn. Woo. Same question. Over. Same question. Um, I mean, it seems, I mean, I, maybe this is naive, but it feels to me like uh, it, you should just hire more people of color to fill administrative positions oh. and teaching positions. Um, and also, there are local organizations that we can partner with. Um, I have a dear friend who runs a nonprofit called Latinos for Education. Seems like a great place. They, they develop fellows, particularly for placement in administrative positions in schools. It seems like a great resource, um, especially the school where my kids go to school. Um, it's a hugely Hispanic population. And so it seems very simple to connect with people like that who then have a pipeline of um, strong developed candidates who can be uh, vetted for those positions. Thank you. Uh, next up, Sarah. The research tells us that when kids of color and white kids have teachers of color, they do better. Uh, so we, absolutely we need more people of color, more adults of color in our schools. I think uh, we're doing a good job of getting more leaders of color in our schools, but we need to do more because leaders of color attract teachers of color. I think we need to build bridges with historically black colleges and universities. I think we need to build a pipeline of teachers of color in our classrooms through fellowships, through training opportunities, um, through um, student teaching assignments, particularly matching teachers of color with student teachers of color. Um, I also think we need to do a better job building bridges between um, the nonprofits serving our communities of color and getting more relationships with adults in those communities into the schools. Um, and I think we need to continue to work to engage families and students of color and giving students and families the sense that they have authentic engagement in the schools. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the recruitment and retention of uh, educators of color is extremely important, and I want to focus on the retention. Uh, I think creating affinity groups for um, educators of color that are already here is extremely important. I also um, will support the district's equity policy, especially with the recruitment of an equity director, and I will support budget items that help retain our um, and, and uplift uh, educators of color voices, and also so our students. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Um, our next question, and Tara, you'll lead this one off. Uh, we got this one from the audience. It was also on our, um, uh, our set of questions beforehand. The audience member uh, uses a word I'm not allowed to use on television, so I'm going to go with the question we prepared, but it's the same. Uh, people are very interested in the Powderhouse School project um, that was voted down last session and there is a chance that it could come back before the school committee in the next term. Um, we want to know from all the candidates what factors would you consider in either approving or rejecting the Powderhouse School? So Tara, we'll start with you. <clears throat> um, first of all, I didn't know this was televised. I'm on TV, that makes me nervous. Um, <laughs> um, I, well, I was a big supporter of Powderhouse. I know the people who um, founded the idea and put the proposal 
proposal together. And as a teacher, I have to say it was absolutely the most thrilling and exciting proposal that I've seen to revolutionize school in our district. Um, as a teacher in practice, for the last six years, I have adopted a similar project-based learning, competency-based style in my classroom. Um, being the only teacher for a long time in my school building to be doing it was really, really difficult. Um, but I also I really believe in it, and I think it's the way the, where the future is going, and we should be adapting and moving along and progressing um, to meet the needs of our students through really, really original, innovative planning. And I was really disappointed that it was voted down. Um, it's one of the reasons that I decided to throw my hat in the ring and run because I would like to see. A political will to adapt ideas like that into our system as difficult and as hard as they may be to um, make work for our system but it's really what's best for kids um, so I would I would love to see it come back great thank you sir yeah it's a funny question because Alec and I were just talking about this on Monday and here's what I told him um, back when the mayor approached Sprout about starting Powder House or doing an innovation school. Parentazzi was talking about how what we really needed was a middle school. Um, and when I talk to parents and teachers in the community, I hear over and over again that grades four through eight is where we're really letting our kids down. So I really think that Powder House as an idea at the middle school might meet a strong unmet need in our district, and I'd like to see it there. At the same time, I'm really excited about the project-based learning work that Sprout is doing. Um, and I'd like to see that brought into all of our schools district-wide to help our teachers um, and our principals figure out how do they need to restructure the day to do project-based learning better and what kind of support and training do teachers need to be able to do it effectively. Great. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. So as a parent, when I first heard about the Powder House um, schools, I was so excited. I was like, a uh, high school that um, can fit this niche that's going to be project-based learning. Um, and I, I have also talked to Alec about it. And um, I, I can say, like, I, I was at that meeting when I heard the school committees talk about their concerns. And I am, for one, I'm very excited about what um, the Powder House School, like what they're going to propose. And uh, I, I like to think that project, I'm really excited about the high school because the building itself is very forward thinking and designed for project-based learning. And I think this is something Somerville is already doing. Uh, it's really important for our kids. I think music and arts education is really important. and. Music and arts education is project-based learning. It's sensory, it builds kids, critical thinking skills, empathy for others. So um, yeah, I will definitely consider it and um, talk to my constituents as well as my fellow uh, school committee members. And great, Karen. Um, so I, you know, I started talking to Alec Resnick about Powder House seven or eight years ago. I spent thousands of hours reading it and supporting it and at the end of the day, I voted no on it twice, uh, and I'm very confident in my the reasons I voted no. Uh, I won't go into them in detail, but they they break down into concerns about the lack of a detailed plan, concerns about the partner, and real deep concerns about equity. While the, I was chairing the, the Powder House approval process during this year, and over the last, actually the last year and a half, the high school and Next Way Full Circle through Bar Foundation grants, much less funding than what Powder House has at $10 million and four, now six dedicated staff, have worked on redesigning the education plan so that while running a district of 5,000. So there will be significant off site learning. We're looking at redoing the schedule so that we're not in, locked into these seven classes slots. It doesn't allow for flexibility, it doesn't allow for deep learning. There's already plans, the new building where we'll be uh, integrating education where, th and a quick example would be a physics lab next to automotive. So the automotive students can go to the physics lab and the physics students can go in the automotive, uh, automotive lab and see what it looks like. So uh, while there are merits to the Powder House proposal, we're already doing that work in this district. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question, and Sarah, you'll start this question. Um, again, this is, I think, an equity question, too. How do you plan to engage with parents and families that have obstacles or barriers to attending meetings with school committee members? That's a great question. Um, I would do it in two ways. The first is um, I would reach out to institutions and organizations 
in the communities that we're not serving very well. So places like um, the Welcome Project, places like the Haitian Church um, over by Broadway, places like um, Connection, uh, Groundwork Somerville, um, Teen Empowerment, right? I would go to the places where people are and I would start with one-on-ones with the leaders there to find out what are the issues that their constituents are concerned about. And I would ask them, who else should I talk to? And I would have one-on-ones with those folks. And I would try to build up to um, having a forum co-sponsored by the school committee and by the institutions and the people that the communities were not engaging trust and going to them to find out what their concerns are and then figuring out how can we bring those concerns into the agenda of the school committee? Because I agree, we're not hearing everybody's voice. Great, thank you. Michelle. So one of the meetings I attended was this wonderful presentation by um, our, our district members, our teachers, administrator, and there were so few people in attendance, I was like shocked. Uh, one of the things I think we need is childcare. I mean, it's a basic, I have three children, it's really hard to come to a meeting when you have your kids at home and you have no sitter. Uh, another thing, it, yeah, it's true. <laughs> My husband's home today. Uh, uh, another thing is also just as a special educator, I make sure that things are very accessible. We cannot have jargon on our on our PowerPoint with. Um, like I call it the alphabet soup with IEP, ABA, PBIS. We need to explain to people and do it in a user-friendly language. I think our sites need to be accessible to everyone. We need to have, um, you know, just easy to understand language. And I do agree that we need better places and we, to, we need to do better reach, reach out to our community. And schools are a great place to do that, as well as connecting with our amazing list of community partners in this community. Great, thank you. Karen. Well, there's two ways. I mean, as a school committee member, it's, for me, it's both formal and informal, uh, and it's listening. It's listening really hard. Um, I often joke, Market Basket is my office, but it's where being in the community and participating is where you happen upon families who are not the ones who are going to write a hundred signed petition. You know, I, I want to hear from all families, but it's often families who feel more marginalized who aren't going to contact me. So it is my responsibility to be accessible. And it's not just families, it's students. Uh, I believe strongly that the most important voice that we listen to are students. And in that formal, you know, we, we bring students into school committee, but that's not a comfortable situation for most of our kids. Really, uh, the kids I carpool in the back of my minivan are my, some of my greatest sources of information. So it's listening, it's creating an, an atmosphere of, of respect and, and knowing that when you speak, I am going to listen. And that we need to expand to our schools. In a very structured way, we've redesigned the Somerville Family Learning Collaborative so that we're going to increase. Um, that is our main connection between families. So there's both individual and systematic change that needs to happen. Great, thank you. Tara? Um, I would say my experience as a teacher, um, trying to reach families and communicate with families, especially families um, whose language I don't speak. Um, in my own experience, I have worked really hard to create um, a classroom, basically, that's online where t uh, students and their families can interact with me personally through um, email and you know phone calls. And if that is not accessible, then our school building has uh, translators who we can work with to contact families and have like meaningful conversations with them about how their child is doing. Um, as a parent with children in the school system, my kids go to East Somerville School, which has a lot of the same issues that we have in the school where I teach, where a lot of um, families are, are actually pretty involved because East Somerville does a really good job of communicating with um, families using four different languages. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that comes home from school that's really deep to get through. Um, but the information is there, and they, they reach out to families, and they make um, meetings available in the mornings before school starts and at the end of the day after school ends. Um, and just increasing the number of hours and opportunities for contact, I think, is a really important thing, aside from also making families feel seen and heard and welcomed in the school. Great. Thank you. Um, so our final question, this actually came in from multiple people in the crowd, so I'm going to defer to the people that are in the room now. Um, people want to know, particularly with um, all of the news, uh, recent news about the MCAS, um, recently not so positive um, news, 
about those questions. What are your feelings on the MCAS and, and the use of standardized testing within the Somerville Public Schools? So for this question, we'll start with Michelle. I love this question. I've been proctoring the MCAS now for like over a decade, and the number one question I get from students is, if I don't pass, will I not be able to move on to the next grade level? And, and this is not just my students with disabilities. This is every, every child. Um, I, I don't think that getting rid of the MCAS will get rid of these educational disparities. I, I think it's a part of the conversation. We need to recognize that our students are, are people of this world who have individual thoughts and feelings. I also think the MCAS is a summative assessment, which means it's a summary of learning. What teachers get is formative assessments, which inform instruction. And these happen every day. And this is how we reach our students. This is what we use to make sure that we're targeting all our, our all our learners and I think we can be giving teachers more resources to make these kinds of assessments um, which they're using every day more available and um, also provide instructional practices and resources that can benefit all our students great Carrie um, I love this question uh, I, I, I believe assessments are absolutely essential you need to know where kids are making progress and where the gaps are. I don't believe MCAS is the most effective. One of the other earliest votes I took was to develop alternative assessments. Somerville is one of the state leaders. We're the founding, one of the founding members of the Massachusetts Consortium of Innovation Assessment, uh, Education Assessments. So speaking of all the letters, I can't stand how many, and uh, it's alphabet soup. So what it means is that a teacher can develop, instead of having to teach to the test, a teacher has the freedom to, to, to develop a curriculum unit and then to develop the assessments afterwards. So the assessments aren't driving the curriculum. The curriculum is teacher developed. It gets to the point of our teachers are so smart and should have more autonomy and we respect them as educators. So they can develop their own curriculum and then develop the assessments so that we know and, and, and quickly know what students do understand, what they don't understand, where the gaps are. Is it one student? Is it a systemic problem in the classroom that the lesson needs to be tweaked or maybe retaught? So it's one of the things I'm most proud of that Somerville is one of the, the leaders in the state. And I'm, I'm hoping it'll go uh, statewide and replace the MCAS. Great. Thanks, Tara. Um, unfortunately, I don't think M MCAS is going anywhere as much as I don't uh, agree with it. I, I see a lot of students who, I teach math, which is a love it or hate it uh, topic, and I get a lot of students in my class who, I think about the kids who my, my kids go to school with who are um, native Spanish speakers who are learning English for the first time when they enter kindergarten. And they're being tested in third grade. Uh, they're given the MCAS for the first time. And it takes a picture of who they are at that moment, it, which is actually a, a kid who's bilingual, who can speak two languages. I, I can't speak two languages. Um, and that picture of who that kid is sticks with them for a long time. And I see kids like that in high school who have a very fixed image of who they are based on a number that they were given when they were eight years old, or, you know, and, and on and on and on. Um, I also see in my own kids, I mean, my, my son, he was in fifth grade this year. He took the STAR assessment, the um, Dibbles test, the MCAS, he, you know, they, I mean, they're testing them also for their, their Spanish fluency because he's in the UNIDOS program. So he had a full two months of like solid testing. It's just too much testing. So I'm, I'm for less testing. Um, teachers know who their students are. They're, they're assessing them every day to see where they're at in their learning. Um, a, a number on an MCAS score is, it's a number. Great, thank you. Sarah. Overall, I want to see less testing and more learning. Um, by some estimates, our kids are spending 20 to 25 hours out of the school year taking tests. That's way too much time. I'm a researcher, right? I believe that we get better when we reflect on our progress, but I don't think our current testing regime is helping us do that, right? My kids' MCAS scores won't be available until next year, which means that my kid's teacher can help my kid get better. When we base teacher evaluations on their growth on standardized tests, we know that scores are so unreliable that you can't separate the signal from the noise. When we base school accountability decisions on the proficiency of kids in the school, basically all we're doing is identifying high SES schools. That's not cool. I'd rather see us spend the money that we're spending to administer and score high stakes tests 
on programs to improve teaching in low SES schools. Um, that said, I do think that we need to benchmark progress against our values. When No Child Left Behind was first passed, organizations like the NAACP heralded it as a way of marking wide standing achievement gaps. I don't think testing is necessarily the way to do it, but I think measuring progress is important. Great, thank you. Can everyone give a big round of applause for our school committee candidates? <laughs>